The Headless Cat by Elliot O'Donnell. It was related to me by Mr. Robert Dane, who was at one time a tenant of Number Blank, Lower Seedley Road, Seedley. I quote it as nearly as possible in his words, thus. When we, my wife and I, took Number Blank, Lower Seedley Road, no possibility of the place being haunted crossed our minds. Indeed, ghosts were the very last things we reckoned on, as neither of us had the slightest belief in them. Like the generality of solicitors, I am stodgy and unimaginative, whilst my wife is the most practical and matter-of-fact little woman you would meet in a day's march. Nor was there anything about the house that in it in any way suggested the superphysical. It was airy and light, no dark corners nor sinister staircases, and equipped throughout with all modern conveniences. We began our lease in June, the hottest June I remember, and nothing occurred to disturb us till October. It happened then in this wise. I will quote from my diary. Monday, October 11th. Dick, that is my brother-in-law, and I, at 11 p.m., were sitting, smoking, and chatting together in the study. All the rest of the household had gone to bed. We had no light in the room, as Dick had a headache, save the fire, and that burned so low that its feeble glimmering scarcely enabled us to see each other's face. After a space of sudden and thoughtful silence, Dick took the stump of a cigar from his lips and threw it in the grate, where, for a few minutes, it lay glowing in the gloom. Jack, he said, you will think me mad, but there is something deuced queer about this room tonight, something in the atmosphere I cannot define, but which I have never felt here, or indeed anywhere, before. Look at that cigar end. Look! I did so, and received a shock. What I saw was certainly not the stump Dick had had in his mouth, but an eye, a large, red, and lurid eye, that looked up at us with an expression of the utmost hate. Dick raised the shovel, and struck at it, but without effect. It still glared at us. A great horror then seized us, and unable to remove our gaze from the hellish thing, we sat glued to our chairs, staring at it. This state of affairs lasted till the clock in the hall outside struck twelve, when the eyes suddenly vanished, and we both felt as if some intensely evil influence had been suddenly removed. Dick did not like the idea of sleeping alone, and asked if he might keep the electric light on in his room all night. Tremendous extravagance, but under the circumstances, excusable. I confess devoutly, wished it was morning. Tuesday, October 12th. I was awakened at 11.30 p.m. by Delia, saying to me, Oh, Edward! There have been such dreadful noises on the landing, just as if a cat were being worried to death by dogs. Hark! There it is again! And as she spoke, from apparently just outside the door, came a series of loud screeches, accompanied by savage growls and snarls. Not knowing what to make of it, as we had no animals of our own in the house, but concluding that a door or a window having been left open, a dog and cat had got in from outside. I lit a candle and opened the bedroom door. Instantly the sound ceased, and there was dead silence, and although I searched everywhere, not a vestige of any animal was to be seen. Moreover, all the doors leading into the garden were shut and locked, and the windows closed. Not wishing to frighten Delia, I laughingly assured her the cat, a black tom, was all right, that it was sitting on the roof of the summer house, looking none the worse for its treatment, and that I had sent the dog, a terrier, flying out the gate with a well-deserved kick. I explained it was my fault about the front door being left open, 
my brain had been a bit overstrained through excessive work, and asked her on no account to blame the servants. I grow alarmed at times when I realize how easy lawyering makes lying. Friday, October 21st. On my way to bed last night, I encountered a rush of icy cold air at the first bend of the staircase. The candle flared up, a bright blue flame, and went out. Something, an animal of sorts, came tearing down the stairs past me, and on peering over the banisters I saw, looking up from me from the well of darkness beneath, two big red eyes, the counterparts of the one Dick and I had seen in October 11. I threw a matchbox at them, but without effect. It was only when I switched on the electric light that they had disappeared. I searched the house most carefully, but there were no signs of any animal. Joined Delia, feeling nervous and henpecky. Monday, November 7th. Tom and Mabel came running into Delia's room in a great state of excitement after tea today. Mother! they cried. Mother, do come. Some horrid dog has got a cat in the spare room and is tearing it to pieces. Delia, who was mending my socks at the time, flung them everywhere, and springing to her feet, flew to the spare room. The door was shut, but proceeding from within was the most appalling pandemonium of screeches and snarls, just as if some dog had got hold of a cat by the neck and was shaking it to death. Delia swung open the door and rushed in. The room was empty, not a trace of a cat or dog anywhere, and the sound ceased. On my return home, Delia met me in the garden. Jack, she said, I have probed the mystery at last. The house is haunted. We must leave. Saturday, November 12th. Sublet House to James Barstow, retired oil merchant, today. He comes in on the 30th. Hope you'll like it. Tuesday, November 15th. Cook left today. I've no fault to find with you, Mum, she condescendingly explained to Delia. It's not you, nor the children, nor the food. It's the noises at night. Screeches outside my door, which sound like a cat but which I know can't be a cat, as there is no cat in the house. This morning, Mum, shortly after the clock struck two, things came to a climax. Hearing something in the corner, and wondering if it was a mouse, I ain't a bit afraid of mice, Mum. I sat up in bed and was getting ready to strike a light. The matchbox was in my hand, when something heavy, sprang right on top of me, and gave a loud growl in my ear. That finished me, Mum. I fainted. When I came to myself, I, I was too frightened to stir, but lay with my head under the blankets till it was time to get up. I then searched everywhere, but there was no sign of any dog, and as the door was locked, there was no possibility of any dog having got in during the night. Mum! I wouldn't go through what I suffered again for fifty pounds. I've got palpitations even now, and I would rather go without my month's wages than sleep in that room another night." Delia paid her up to date, and she went directly after tea. Friday, November 18th. As I was coming out of the bathroom at 11 p.m., something fell into the bath with a loud splash. I turned to see what it was. There was nothing there. I ran up the stairs to bed, three steps at a time. Sunday, November 20th. Went to church in the morning, and heard the usual Oxford drawl. On the way back, I was pondering over the sermon, and wishing I could contort the law as successfully as Parsons contort the scriptures, when Dot, she is six today, came running up to me with a very scared expression in her eyes. Father, she cried, plucking me by the sleeve, do hurry up. Mother is very ill. 
Full of dreadful anticipations, I tore home, and on arriving found Delia lying on the sofa in a violent fit of hysterics. It was fully an hour before she recovered sufficiently to tell me what had happened. Her account runs thus. After you went to church, she began, I made the custard pudding, jelly, and blancmange for dinner, heard the children their collects, and had just sat down with the intention of writing a letter to mother, when I heard a very pathetic mew coming, so I thought, from under the sofa. Thinking it was some stray cat that had gotten in through one of the windows, I tried to entice it out by calling, Puss, Puss, and making the usual silly noise people do on such occasions. No cat coming out, and the mewing still continuing, I knelt down and peered under the sofa. There was no cat there. Had it been night, I should have been very much afraid, but I could scarcely reconcile myself to the idea of ghosts with the room filled with sunshine. Resuming my seat, I went on with my writing, but not for long. The mewing grew nearer. I distinctly heard something crawl out from under the sofa. There was then a, a, a pause, during which you could have heard the proverbial pinfall, and then something sprang upon me and dug its claws in my knees. I looked down, and to my horror and distress, perceived, standing on its hind legs, pawing at my clothes, a large tabby cat without a head, the neck terminating in a mangled stump sight so appalled me that I, I, I don't know what happened, but nurse and the children came in and found me lying on the floor in hysterics. Can't we leave the house at once? Wednesday, November 30th. Left number blank, Lower Seedley Road, at 2 p.m. Had an awful scurry to get things packed in time, and dread opening certain of the packing cases, lest we shall find all the crockery smashed. Just as we were starting, Delia cried out that she had left her reticule behind, and I was dispatched in search of it. I searched everywhere, till I was worn out, for I know what Delia is, and was leaving the premises in full anticipation of being sent back again, when there was a loud commotion in the hall, just as if a dog had suddenly pounced upon a cat, and the next moment a large tabby, with a head hewn away as Delia had described, rushed up to me and tried to spring on to my shoulders. At this juncture one of the servants cautiously opened the hall door from without and informed me that I was wanted. The cat instantly vanished and, on my reaching the carriage in a state of breathless haste and trepidation, Delia told me she had found her reticule. She had been sitting on it all the time. In a subsequent note in his diary, a year or so later, Mr. Dane says, after innumerable inquiries read the history of Number Blank, Lower Seedley Road, prior to our inhabiting it, I have at length elicited the fact that twelve years ago a Mr. and Mrs. Barlow lived there. They had one son, Arthur, whom they spoilt in the most outrageous fashion, even to the extent of encouraging him in acts of cruelty. To afford him amusement, they used to buy rats for his dog, a fox terrier, to worry, and on one occasion proved cured a stray cat, which the servants afterwards declared was mangled in the most shocking manner, before being finally destroyed by Arthur. Here, then, in my opinion, is a very feasible explanation for the hauntings. The phenomenon seen was the phantasm of the poor, tortured cat. For if human tragedies are reenacted by ghosts, why not animal tragedies, too? It is absurd to suppose man has the monopoly of soul or spirit. End of The Headless Cat Thank you.